All right. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I know there were a few really great sessions at this time, so the fact that you're all here in this one is a really, really big compliment. So um, my goal is to make you feel like you uh, made a good choice by coming today. Um, so like, uh, I, I'm going to be talking about the Freelancer's Guide to Client Onboarding. Now, I don't need to introduce myself because I just had a wonderful introduction there, so I'm just going to skip, get right into it. Um, today, I'm going to show you how you can design an onboarding process that wins you more projects, delights your clients, and solves some of your biggest client headaches. So it's a tall order. And the presentation has three parts. So the first part, I'm going to really briefly go through what onboarding is and why it's important, just to get everybody on the same page. So really, really quickly go through this. Then I'm going to talk about the four things that make a really great onboarding process. And then in part three, which is the meat of the presentation, I'm going to go through an example of a really good onboarding process that you can copy and use um, in your own projects. So what is onboarding and why is it important? Well, onboarding is basically the process that moves a person from being a lead into being a client. Now, a lot of people see onboarding as just that part where a proposal has been accepted and you are getting the client familiar with working with you and starting the project. I actually see onboarding right from first contact all the way till the project starts. So I see it as a slightly longer process. And onboarding is really, really important. I think it's one of the most important things you can do, and that's for three main reasons. Um, first off, you can set expectations during the onboarding. So you can basically prevent so many problems that freelancers have during the onboarding stage. Um, some of the most common problems that I get asked about all the time are things like clients who are micromanaging, clients who are, um, you know, there's scope creep happening where they're trying to get more things into the project that they haven't budgeted for. Um, and you can prevent a lot of those things and actually Prevention is much better than trying to fix them um, as they actually happen, and you can do that in the onboarding. Secondly, onboarding makes you look really good. So first impressions are so, so important. And how you start the project is really going to set the scene for how the rest of the project goes. If you start on the right foot, your client is going to think really well of you throughout the whole project. Um, if you have a bad first impression, it's a lot harder to recover from. So it just makes sense to just try and get yourself started, get yourself the best first impression that you can. And finally, onboarding is a really quick win. So it doesn't take much to have an onboarding process in place. You don't need anything too fancy. You can get it done really, really quickly. Um, and also the uh, onboarding for every client stays the same uh, for basically everybody. So it can just be, it's kind of like the low hanging fruit, if you like. So that's what onboarding is and why it's important. Um, now I'm gonna go through the four things that make a really good onboarding process or really a really good process in general. So a great onboarding process should be useful. It should be reusable it should be profitable, and it should be delightful. And what I mean by those is, by useful, I mean it should be useful for your clients. So there shouldn't be any fluff in it. You know, We're not doing an onboarding process just to tick a box. You're doing it because you want your clients to actually find it useful. So if it's not useful, it doesn't need to be there. But also it needs to be useful for you as well as a business owner, because as a freelancer, you wear a lot of different hats. You're trying to do marketing, you're trying to do um, case studies and all these different things alongside doing your client work. And that can be really challenging, but you can bake into your onboarding process things that are gonna really help you with all of these. And a really good example is um, something like testimonials. So a lot of people don't realize that actually during the onboarding stage is a really good opportunity for you to ask for a testimonial. You don't have to wait till the end of the project. And actually at the start of the project, it can be a really good idea to ask for one because the client is really excited and you've made a fantastic first impression. Um, you can also um, set the scene for, different, for creating a case study. Um, so you can have maybe a questionnaire or something in place. So you can create your case study throughout the entire project rather than just trying to do it and remember at the end 
um, everything that you went through. So next, it should be reusable. Um, this one's pretty obvious. You want to reuse as much of your onboarding process as possible because that's going to save you time. You don't want to be redoing the same things over and over and over again. Um, it just doesn't make sense, and you don't really have the time for that. But actually, I'd argue more importantly, making things reusable makes it easier for you to delegate things out. So if you don't already have some kind of assistant, um, I think that an assistant, the onboarding, getting an assistant to do take over the onboarding for you is one of the easiest things that you can outsource. Um, and I really think every freelancer um, should probably get an assistant sooner than they think. Um, I didn't, and I really, really regret it. Um, I think even with a couple of hours a day, having someone help you with these tasks that you put in place um, is just going to take so much off your plate. Interesting. Okay. Well, the other one was that it needs to be profitable. <laughs> so um, this one's pretty obvious, but um, like I said, I talk about the process being from first contact to um, the start of the project. Um, so you want to actually win that project first and foremost. Um, but you also want to bake in things into your onboarding process that can help you uh, make a profit later on. So the thing I always like to remember is that um, every lead is a contact. And even if you don't end up working with that client, um, you should still be saving them somewhere. If you don't already have some kind of CRM, which is basically a database to store people, um, you should create one, even if it's just a spreadsheet. And every time you do a discovery call with a client, um, even if they don't accept the project, they should be a lead in your in your database because as you're growing your freelance business, um, you're going to be becoming more proactive in reaching out to people and you need a network of people that you can reach out to when you have different offerings available. And so baking these little things like this into your process that you can't rely on yourself to remember as you're doing it, it's just going to be really helpful for you long term. And then finally, it should be delightful. So experience is really important. And I think it's something that as freelancers, we tend to forget. I used to work in a design agency, an in-person one, and uh, we used to bring clients in and we used to you know, give them spreads of food and show them presentations like with the big boards, kind of like Mad Men style. And they loved it and they would pay so much more money to work for it, the agency, then they would potentially have to pay a freelancer. But they did it because they liked the experience. And um, I'm not saying that freelancers need to do any of that. We tend to work remotely, so it doesn't always work out. But I think if you can bake little, in, in little bits of your process, you can bake tiny bits of delight. Um, it's going to really, really um, help you and build those relationships that last for a really long time. So. Now we're going to get into the example. So this is my six-step onboarding process. And you might be doing a lot of this already, um, but these are really the six steps that I would do every time a lead first contacts me to when the project begins. So step one, we want to first qualify the client. And that basically means that we want to weed out any bad fits as quickly as possible because I'm sure we've all been there where we've spent time and effort doing a call, writing a proposal, and then you find out the client had a budget of, you know, like 50 euros or something like that. And it's really, really frustrating because you just feel like you've wasted a ton of time. So you want to kind of get rid of those if you can and just pull through the people who are going to make really, really good clients for you. But the second goal really is you want to respond as quickly as you can. So when you're knee deep in client work, it's really hard sometimes to respond to all these new leads that come in. But responding quickly is so important um, because, you know, now I'm on the other side of freelancing. I tend to hire freelancers more than, you know, work. I don't work as a freelancer anymore. I tend to hire them. And there's something about that first freelancer who responds to me that almost automatically shortlists them. 
And back when I was freelancing, I didn't respond quickly because I didn't want to seem like I was too desperate or too keen. And now looking back, I can see that was a big mistake. Responding quickly is a really easy way to just get yourself that little bit ahead if a client is potentially looking at a few other freelancers alongside you. So this is what you want to do. When a new lead contacts you, you basically just want to have a series of templated emails ready to send out. Now, I know there's a lot of information on this slide, so don't worry too much. Um, basically, I had to cut a lot out of this talk to get it to fit within 30 minutes. Um, but what I've done is I've written down the, these four email templates that I think everybody needs as a minimum. So we've got the initial response email where we've got five pre-qualifying questions to make sure that they have the budget it, they have the deadline and a few other things to make sure that they're a good fit working with you. Um, you have a template that if they do not pass that uh, initial response uh, and you think, no, they're not a good fit, you want to have a really nice rejection template that doesn't burn any bridges because remember, every lead is still a contact. They might not be a great fit for you now. That does not mean that they're not going to be a great fit for you one day in the future. Then if they are a good fit, you want to have another templated email to book a discovery call um, and you know how that will work, what the schedule is. And then finally, you want a templated follow-up email to just nudge them to book that call. Um, and I've got a link to download these templates at the end. Um, there's no catch. There's no, I don't ask for an email address or anything like that. I just couldn't fit them into the presentation. So... Now we've done the qualifying the client. Let's say, okay, they're a great fit. We want to work with them. Now we're going to book a discovery call with them. And I, some people don't think discovery calls are important. I personally think they are. Um, and that's for three reasons. First off, you're going to build rapport with people. Um, so we're working with people. And I think any opportunity you can have to humanize yourself and humanize them and build a kind of connection is going to be really helpful. I think in person is the best kind of thing you can do for basically everything. Every good thing that's happened in my business has usually come down to some kind of in-person event or some kind of relationship that I've made. As a freelancer, in-person isn't often possible. So the next best thing is to get on a call where you can see their face, they can see yours, and you can chat. You also want to provide value on this call. So show them how great it would be to work with you. Um, but without necessarily turning it into a consulting call. So another thing that um, freelancers often say to me is they do these calls, they're really, really helpful, and they're spending like an hour, two hours, maybe even more, just helping the client, giving them so much information, and they're super, super pumped. And then their client doesn't even hire them. I mean, that, and they're so disheartened because they feel really, really taken advantage of. So when you're doing these calls, you want to have them mapped out and remember that it's your responsibility to make sure the call only lasts maybe 30 minutes, 45, whatever you decide, keep it on schedule. So have something templated in your script, in your head, for when you feel it turning into a more consulting call, um, you can then push it. Uh, to maybe say something like, oh, this is a really great topic. I'd love, to get in, I'd love to get into it with you even more. Let me send you some information about this package that I've got that could really help you. And you can send them a package for, to book a consulting hour or two hours with you. Um, so that's another thing that's really important with the call. And then finally, you want to get all the information that you need for your proposal. So... I'll talk about this next, but we're going to be writing the proposal immediately after the call. So I actually think throughout the call, uh, the, really the most important thing is the follow-up afterwards. Um, and the reason I think this is the most important part is because, first off, hopefully, this is where your client's most excited. But secondly, this is something that no one really does, at least in my experience, even though it's so, so easy. Um, so what you want to do is you want to do three things. You want to follow up via email immediately. Just send one quick email that said, it was so great talking to you. Um, I'm really excited about this project. I'm going to be working on the proposal today and I'll get it to you tomorrow. That's it. And then hit send. In my experience, people don't do this. And it's such a, it's so disappointing as the client because you don't really feel as valued. And the next thing you want to do 
is add them to your CRM. So I say this a lot. And then the third thing, you're going to write your proposal straight after the call while it's fresh in your mind, and you're going to proofread um, and send the following day. Which leads me to step three, so the proposal. Two goals here. You want to show how great you would be to work with, and this is basically because you are saying, I'm going to get this proposal over you, to you tomorrow. You are then going to get that proposal to them tomorrow. I think doing it quickly is really important. Don't make them wait too long because you might miss that moment that they're really excited. And secondly, you, of course, want to win the proposal. So I recommend everybody block out time. If you use Calendly or some kind of calendar scheduling tool, block out an hour, maybe just 30 minutes after the call to write the proposal. And hopefully you've got all the information you need. You would have a really solid proposal template where most of it is the same and you can just quickly add things that you need to um, throughout the process. So you need a really good process for writing proposals. Don't put it off like I used to do. Um, just get it done straight away. Nobody likes writing proposals. But make sure you wait sleep on it, send it the next day, because you want to give it a quick proofread to notice any mistakes, and then send it. So then, let's say proposal gets accepted. So we're going to send them the paperwork, send them the deposit, send them the contract. This one's super, super easy. Basically, you want to get paid, and you want to cover yourself if there's any problems. So Getting paid, getting paid a deposit is another thing that I hear a lot that is really hard um, for a lot of freelancers because most people aren't ready to work with their client right there and then. They may be available a couple of months in advance, but they need the deposit then, right? To, so you can secure it into your calendar. But a client is thinking, well, if I'm not going to start for a couple of months, what incentive is there to pay now? I'm just going to pay in a couple of months. So I use this email a lot. It doesn't work all the time, but it de definitely helps. And there's a couple of things in this email um, that I think really helped it, where we say, you know, I can't start till May or whatever month, but we can get start working together now. I'll get familiar with your business. You can do some data collection homework, all these things that we've got to get started. Um, so we can start, to get, start working together now, um, which helps them pay their deposit right there and then. Um, and then I say, sound good. If so, as soon as the deposit has been paid, we'll get going. Um, and then I add this bit at the end that just says, slots do tend to follow up quickly, so I recommend paying the deposit as soon as you're able to secure your spot. And, you know, like I said, this doesn't work all the time, but it does work some of the time, um, especially if you have a expiration date for your proposal, because then you can send a couple of follow-up emails to that date to create a little bit of urgency. You know, you can say there's some, there's other people waiting, so your spot's going to go, um, and you know, you really need to pay it now if you want to get that booked in. Otherwise, it's going to be a little bit of a longer wait. So. The next step, once we've sent all the paperwork and hopefully got paid, is we're going to set up our working environment. Um, I like to do this as soon as the deposit's been paid. And this is another reason that having an assistant is going to be super, super helpful because they can do all this for you and just make all these checks to make sure that you are ready from day one to get going. And really the goals for the setup are to preempt any common problems, so things like do, can you log into things you need to log into? Have they sent you a Google link? Do you have the correct sharing permissions? All that kind of stuff that um, I don't know if you've experienced it, but I have so many times where I've been getting started. I'm so finally able to start a project. I try and open a Google link and it says, oh, you need to request access from the client. And it's so frustrating because often they're not in the same time zone. So I've blocked out this time and it, I just, it, and it makes me look bad, right? So you want to preempt all of these as soon as you can um, and just basically be ready to go from day one. Makes you look super, super professional. And so the way I do this is pretty simple. I set up a structure of folders on my computer. So I have, I usually have three phases for a project. This is for a website project where I'd have a discovery phase, which is all the research, the homework. I'd have the website. This is the meat of the project. And then I'd have documents and assets, so all those brand assets and contracts and all that kind of stuff in there. And, oh, this slide doesn't work either. And um, 
So this slide was a uh, slide for a tool I use called Post Haste, but don't worry because it's in the link at the end. I think I linked to it as well. But there's a tool called Post Haste, um, and it's a free tool, and it basically just allows you to create templates of your um, of your folder structures. So you can just one click have them populated every time you get a new project. So it makes it super super easy. And then the other thing I'd recommend when you're doing this welcome packet is to just um, have a single, or getting the documents set up, can't remember, or working environment, um, is just try and have a single source of truth for each client project. So have somewhere where the client can go to access everything. And this could be a Dropbox folder, it could be a Google Drive folder, it doesn't really matter where. Um, the plugin that I have is like basically to solve this problem, but it's you know a portal plugin, but you could use a project management tool or something like that. Just as long as your client has somewhere to access all those things, whether it's a link, a file, contract, the deliverables, whatever it might be. And then finally, the last thing that I like to do for my onboarding is to send a welcome packet. And this is my favorite part. Um, welcome packets basically level expectations. So we talked at the start about any common problems that you see cropping up throughout your project. Have a think about them. They might be different for everybody, but there should be something in your welcome packet that tries to preempt them before they potentially happen. So if scope creep's a big issue, then can you have something in there that says, hey, here's what to do. If the scope increases in the project, that's totally fine. But here's the process and how we get this new feature added and quoted for and added to the timeline. Um, the welcome packet also helps start the project. So if you have um, things for your client to do, intake questionnaires, or um, that maybe they need to write the content for the website, they can start that there. And then finally, I think a welcome packet is a really good way to kind of surprise and delight them because not many people do this. Um, and it just shows your client that, hey, you're a professional, you've done this before, you know what you're doing. Um, and it's just really nice because a lot of the time the experience of working with freelancers might be a little bit, um, might seem a little bit unorganized. Um, and that's obviously because freelancers are busy, they're doing a lot. But to the client, it may seem a little bit unorganized. So it's always nice if you are working with a freelancer who seems to just know what they're doing and they've done this before. So I collect welcome packets because I love them. This is my friend Franz. Um, he uh, sends these to his client. It's just basically some printouts of information about how he works and he sends them like this really nice little bar of chocolate to just welcome their clients into working with them. I thought that was a really nice idea. Um, I also recently got a quote to get our uh, garden, to get a deck for our garden, and they sent us this welcome packet, and it had these things like um, the process timeline. So a lot of the time, clients don't know what the process of working with a web designer or a developer might be, so have a process timeline. It's got some success stories, an agenda for the meeting. They even have a little magazine. Um, they actually even sent us a hamper with like champagne and chocolates and all that kind of stuff. Um, you don't have to go to that extreme. I actually recommend most people with their welcome packets start with a Google Doc, a nicely formatted Google Doc that you can change and edit and tweak until you've got something that really, really works for both you and your clients is the best thing that you can do. And you can then polish that up um, later on if you need to. So. Here are some other things that be, could be included in a welcome packet. I'm going to whiz through them because I'm short on time, but you could have a getting started guide. You can put your paperwork in there, um, information gathering, client homework, uh, any useful links is really important to maybe if you use, I don't know, Pinterest for collecting inspiration or something, and then any handy guides. So this is for things that, you know, if you struggle with, client, uh, your client doesn't give you great feedback, could you have a little guide on how to give great feedback that you can really use? And finally, we wanna use this as an opportunity to just build a little bit of delight into your process. So I always like sending a welcome gift. Um, I see loads of people do this and I just think it's really nice. Um, you can send like Franz did some chocolate. Um, one of my friends I know, he sends a book, um, you know, a really good book that's been really integral to his business. He'll send that to his client. 
Um, some people send coffee beans. Um, this is Lauren Hooker from Ellen Company. She sends a gift card to a local coffee shop or a Starbucks. And just with a note that says, hey, I'm really excited to work with you. Um, I know you need to write your content and that's really, really hard, but just take a morning use this gift card, go to your coffee shop and get your content written for me. And I just think that's a really nice touch. But also remember that being thoughtful and building delight doesn't have to cost you money. You don't always have to buy things. Um, just be thoughtful throughout the whole process. So always be thinking about how you can help your clients, how you can build connections throughout. Be really, really helpful. Um, and that's just a really nice way to be memorable to your clients. So that's my six step onboarding process. And basically when you're designing your own, you need to ask yourself, is it useful? Is it reusable? Is it profitable? And is it delightful? And if it does all these four things, then you've got a great process on your hands. So I would recommend everybody, if you haven't already, spend some time planning out your onboarding experience. So from first contact, it doesn't have to be as fancy as this, just you know, scribble it down, spend a morning in a coffee shop, in your favorite coffee shop, buy yourself a gift card, and just spend a morning or an afternoon thinking about every interaction that you have with your clients um, down to the most minute detail and see the parts that you could template or make reusable. Um, and it's gonna really, really help you. It shouldn't take a lot of time. The emails, I think, are the most important things to template. The other stuff, you can do gradually. So that's it from me. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, like I said, I've got extras here. Thank you if you want to download them. Um, the link is bit.ly wceu hyphen le. That's an L, not an I. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you coming. And yeah, thanks very much. All right. Thank you. A round of applause, please. That was, um, that was great. Thank so. You. Uh, I guess the audience, uh, they are itching for, to ask you questions because we need to get more clients and make more money. So um, that's very important. So um, if you have any questions, please, uh, let me see your hand. Okay, one, um, any, anybody else? Two, three, and four. Okay, let's start with those four. First person, please. So the mic. Right, thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Kevin Roberts, by the way. Uh, oh, Roberts, hello. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I noticed in the slide when you showed the email templates, it seemed like you were using um, uh, one of those automator template uh, things. Uh, do you use something like, uh, um, uh, I forget the name of it. Yeah. Um, there's a couple. So there's text, text expander. Extender, yeah, it looked like that. Yeah, it's, so that's the, that's the really big one that's like super great, so many features. The one in the screenshot was actually one called A-Text. Which uh, I've used both and I'm, I've switched to A-Text as well. Yeah, it's A-Text is so much, I think it's like $5 a year or something. It's you really cheap. You get a cheap. lifetime for like 20 bucks and use it on yeah, five yeah. different things. It's really cheap. And, and it cheap. ultimately does the same thing as text. Like it doesn't have all the features of text expander, but I really like a text because it just does what you need it to do, which is have these um, templates there. So yeah, there's that. And now I use help scout just because I use help scout for my emails and that's got the saved replies in there as well. But yeah, a text is great or text expander is really good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Next person. Okay. Hello. Uh, it's here. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned already uncomfortable situation when a client has a low budget. Um, how do you filter that in the nice way so client will not feel uncomfortable because you already starting speaking about the budget, you know, and you don't want to spend one hour, you know, time and they have just $50. Yeah, so in Thanks. the pre-qualifying email, one of the questions is, do you have a budget and is it over X? Um, and I think the budget thing is really difficult because we're often told, ask the client the budget, don't tell or show your prices, which makes sense to a point, but a lot of clients don't know what their budget is because they don't know what a, a website, for example, should cost. So it can be really difficult to ask that. And um, so I find having, is it over X amount 
is a really good way to just make sure that they're in the range. Or you could say, is it between X and Y? Or you could say, you know, websites vary wildly. Um, it could be anything from this to that. Does this sound about within your range? And if so, whereabouts? And that kind of gives them a starting point because I've been in the situation where I'm, I'm trying to quote, uh, get a quote for a project and they ask me my budget and I say, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't want to offend you by saying something really low. I don't want to say something crazy high in case you think, oh, well, there we go, I'll just <laughs> say that. Um, so I sort of see it from both sides. So that's how I go about that. And then if they say no, um, I think it's perfectly reasonable to say, unfortunately, I can't work with that budget. I always try to recommend them elsewhere. I might either recommend them to someone I know who could work within that budget range, or maybe even just say, you might need to try Upwork or something. Um, yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. OK. Next person. The mic, please. Hi. Hey. Um, you mentioned you have a plugin to do all that, right? Um, sort of. The plugin is um, it's really a place to store deliverables. So it's um, it's basically if you have you know a welcome packet and you have all the different files and folders and links dotted around everywhere. It basically just keeps it all together for your clients. So they just have one login, and they can see everything. Um, it's not a project management tool in the sense that it, it doesn't do any of the, it doesn't have any of those extra bells and whistles. Mostly because I found um, when I had project management tools, my clients weren't using them. So I switched to something a little bit more simple. Um, but yeah, it just keeps it all together. Yeah. OK. All right, there was one more person. OK, please. Hi there. How do you handle like clients that are slightly bigger? Maybe they have like an RFP or something where they want you to kind of go down deeper. Do you kind of put them into your process or do you kind of work a bit around just maybe some stuff on there? So with RFPs, I don't, I've never answered them uh, personally because when I worked in an agency, I learned, and I don't know if this is, I don't know if this is just either, maybe it's, England, I don't know, but I found that with RFPs, a lot of the time, they already know who they are going to work with, and they just have to get other quotes. They have to get X amount of quotes from people, and so you almost never end up winning them, so I always just ignored them. Um, if you did need to do that, um, I think... To be honest, it's a little bit out of my expertise range because I've never, the only time I've answered one was when I worked at an agency and we had the team members available and we they take like a, maybe a junior member of the team um, to work on the RFP and then they'd have it signed off by a senior member. I think it's easier for agencies to do that route, um, but I'm sure there are people who do it successfully. I just, um, I wouldn't actually be able to help much with that because I've never done it. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Somebody at the back, please. Hello. Hello. Uh, how do you differentiate your onboarding process based on whether the client is like non-tech savvy or whether someone needs to speed things up because they are comfortable with onboarding themselves. And meaning that I have seen cases that they feel the onboarding process is really slow because it's really in-depth and welcoming for a non-tech savvy person. But they are frustrated just because of that. And uh, on the other hand, if you try to speed it up, it's much more difficult for a non-tech savvy person. So how, how do you differentiate it between these two types of clients? Yeah, that's a good question. I think. For my onboarding process, it was never, it was never too slow. Um, I think the only thing I would potentially do is if I had a really non-tech savvy client, I would maybe add in an extra call, which would be more of a welcome call where I would go through the onboarding process with them. So, you know, I would go through because I would send the documents and then it's up really up to the client whether they read them or not. Um, if I got the feeling that this client really had never done the project before. And I think one of the questions in the initial 
question email might be, have you worked on a project like this before? That kind of gives me an indication of how much hand-holding they might need. I might just like spend some time and book in an extra call with them and go through all these problems and how it works and, and go through that way. But I would recommend probably having your onboarding process be really, really fast and streamlined, but slowing it down if you think a client needs it, rather than having it really slow and then speeding it up if, you're, if you feel a client doesn't need it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you very much. Do we have other questions, please? Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, I just have a question about uh, when you sent a proposal. Uh, I learned uh, actually two other tricks that um, when you send a proposal, make a, a short video explaining the proposal and send them together. So it's not uh, mm. just a, a written document. Yeah. I. Um, so interestingly, yesterday I was. I was, in a, I was in a Facebook group that's for freelancers, and they were talking about actually presenting their proposals on a call in person. Mm -hmm. I found that was quite interesting actually because um, it's not something, unless you do paid discovery, which is basically where they, the client pays you to do a proposal, which for that garden design company is exactly what happened. We paid them to do a proposal. I'm actually very pro paid discovery. It's just too much you know, to go into in the talk. Um, but yeah, I think anything that you can do with like a welcome video is a great idea to just walk them through it or um, I'd maybe even change you know, what I say and say, maybe um, go through the proposal on a call with them and get them to commit to it there and then. But that's not something I've tried, but I can see it working really well. Um, but the video is a great idea because it's like a mix between the two, right? It's not a live call that you have to do, but it's not just sending a proposal and hoping for the best. So yeah. it's a good idea. Maybe in the, in the admin bar. Sorry? In the admin bar is the, the group. You that's exactly it. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. You <laughs> saw the same thread. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. Just thank you. Thanks. I'm going to watch that again. That was great. Oh, thank you. Um, do you have any advice on writing contracts? And if do you ever skip the contract completely? Or how do you simplify it enough for the client where it's not intimidating? So I think that's a good question. The with contracts, what I did, and unfortunately this isn't available anymore, so I can't point you to the link, but there was a service where they, well, it wasn't a service, they had a contract, and then they had a guide to the contract, where the contract was rewritten in plain English that just explained what each term meant. And I went through it and where you need to tweak it, it was for freelancers, where you need to, I think it was Paul Jarvis, if anyone remembers him, years and years ago, he did a lot for freelancers. Um, and that was really helpful for me because I felt like before I felt I had a contract that was kind of a standard one that I'd found, but if a client ever challenged me about any of it, I don't know if I'd be able to really say, oh yeah, what that was. So I really liked having, n being confident in knowing what each part of the contract was for and why it was there. Um, that said, with contracts, it's really difficult because depending on the price of your projects, how enforceable they are is, I, I mean, I don't, I've never been in the process where I've had to enforce one. And when you're working with clients in different countries, um, I think unless you're doing like really, really big projects, I don't even know if it would be worth enforcing it. Like if a client didn't pay, like I don't know what you could do. Um, so it's one of those things where I think, yes, it's important to have a contract um, because, you know, it just adds a little bit of cover for you. In practice, how much it would help you, I don't know. Um, because you'd have to get a lawyer, it costs a lot of money, maybe it would cost more than the proposal itself, and it depends what you're charging. Um, I don't know if I would not have a contract. Yeah, it's difficult. I think that's just something you'd have to decide for yourself. Um, yeah, you could potentially not have a contract and just go for it, I think, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Thank you very much. Any more questions, please? Okay, we have one. Uh, 
Hi, Laura. Uh, really great talk. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Um, when you come to proposals, there's acceptance, rejection, and ghosting. What happens with you know, what sort of process do you go through when you get, immediately get an email saying, "Oh, thanks. I'll be in touch," and then you know, like chasing it and and, and what have you. So. You, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. I know what you mean. I have, <laughs> yeah, I do have a couple of follow-up emails that I'll send. Um, usually you can kind of tell if they're not really going for it. If they, if you really think they're just ghosting you, um, I would, instead of trying to win them back, I personally would try to get to the bottom of why. So I'd say something like, you know, it looks like you're not interested or you found something else. Um, would you mind telling me why, like why it didn't work out? Just to get feedback for me to know like where did I go wrong in the process? I think that would be more valuable than actually even winning the project in a lot of cases because you don't always know like what you're doing. You know, you think you're doing everything right and you don't know what your client's thinking. Um, but yeah, the ghosting is, is really, really tough. The other thing I would say is that's why the pre-qualifying is really important. Um, and hopefully by the time you get to the discovery call, you know, if your website's really good as well, and that's gonna help have your clients hopefully ready to work with you, um, you would hopefully be fairly confident in the discovery call. And then if not, if it doesn't work out, you don't want to have spent much time writing the proposal. So it's why I recommend maybe like 30 minutes max to write the proposal after the call have it super, super templated and a couple of follow-up emails and then just use it as a bit of a learning experience. And like I say, every the way I just try to think of these things just to make me not too depressed when they happen, because they do happen, is that every call is another practice at a sales call. Um, and every person that you interact with can be added and they might end up using you in the future. Like it's not wasted as long as you haven't put too much time and effort into it, it's not fully wasted, but you can't control um, whether a client gets back to you or whether they accept the proposal. You can only control what you're doing and giving the best proposal that you can and doing the best process and just trying to like get feedback on like how you're doing um, and then doing things like learning about sales, learning about how to do calls and just keep practicing. But I don't think there's really another easy answer for it, unfortunately. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly the same. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> um, just very quickly follow up on what sort of like timescales do you kind of go like, okay, I've not heard back in like two weeks or something. Is, it, is there any sort of timescale? Sorry, um, that's a follow up question. I don't have a specific timescale. I suppose I would probably, I think, yeah, two weeks, I think sounds reasonable. It depends on the size of the project as well, though, and the size of the budget. Like bigger projects, bigger budgets, bigger companies might have a different process that could take longer. So it's going to be a little bit of trial and error. You know, if it's kind of a smaller company, maybe you're just talking to the founder, I would say two weeks is reasonable. If it's a bigger company, um, maybe you would want to find out from them what their process is for getting things like this approved because there might be extra steps you need to take. It might take a little bit longer um, and all that kind of thing. So yeah. Two weeks to four weeks, I would say, yeah. All right, thank you. I'm afraid that's all the questions we can take. Um, thank you, uh, Laura, once again. Please, a round of applause. That was wonderful. Thank I you. totally enjoyed that from you.